Okay, so this video is to help you review for your Algebra 1 5th, 6 weeks test. Problems 1 through 4 on the first page ask you to find the domain and range of vertical parabolas. So let's jump right in. On number 1, you can see the uh, picture on the video. And we'll start with domain. Domain is the side-to-side -side distance. Well, this parabola we know keeps going up, but it's also slowly moving in this direction slowly moving in this direction. So it's going side to side forever, which means my domain is all real numbers. My, dom my domain is all real numbers. Now my range, the smallest y value I touch is right here, and it goes up forever, so I don't have a top y value, which means if the smallest i can be is negative 4 and up, it means that y has to be greater than or equal to negative 4. Because right here I get to touch y equals negative 4, but I get bigger than it. Same thing for number 2, we have a vertical parabola, so we know off the bat that domain is all real numbers. And then we have to find our range. Well, this time the highest value is y equals 4. And I get, I'm get i moving slowly downward, which means y has to be less than or equal to 4. Again, the same kind of problem. Number 3, let's know the domain range. Well, we know the domain is all reals. Vertical parabolas always have all reals as their domain. The range is going to start at 8 this time, so y is less than or equal to 8. And for the last one, again, you have an up and down parabola, so your domain is going to be all real numbers. Oops, don't need that one. And your range is going to be from this bottom piece right here up, so my range to y is greater than or equal to negative 1. So number 5 and 6 on your review are about the graph on the screen, and so question 5 says, what is the range of the quadratic function graph below if the function is translated up 4 units? So to translate up, you can grab any point on the parabola. I'm going to grab the vertex right here. I'm just going to move it up 1, 2, 3, 4 units, but it's a different color. So here's my vertex. I'm going to move it up 1, 2, 3, four units. So here's my new vertex. And you can grab any point on the parabola and do this, but this is my vertex, which means now my parabola is going to do this. So if I want to know what the range is, now that I've moved it up four units, I'm looking at right here. This is my lowest y value right here, which is two. So my range is going to be, for my range for number five, it's going to be y is greater than or equal to 2, because I touch 2 right here, and I go up, I get bigger. So I touch 2, and I get bigger. And then the next problem says, what would have happened if you had the same graph, but instead of moving it up for you, we're going to move it down 1. So again, I'm going to go back to my vertex right here, and I'm going to move it down 1 right there. So now I would have had like this graph. So if that's my graph, the yellow one, my lowest value now is right here, which is negative 3. I'm still opening up, so y is greater than or equal to negative 3. So problem number 10 says that Neil used the graph below, which you can see on my screen, to solve a quadratic equation. He found the solutions were 1 and 4. What is the equation that Neil graphed? So... Those are my two solutions. And so if you're going to write something, you have y equals a x minus 1, x minus 4. It's always x minus, and then whatever the x-intercept was. So if you look right here, this is my x. Here's my... Here's my minus, and then at the very end, this 1 was my x-intercept, that's what it said in the problem. Same thing with the 4. And then we just need to find that a value, or make sure the a value is 1. So to do that, easiest thing to do is go to the graph and find a point. So let's find a point, and it can't be one of the x-intercepts. So we should probably use something very easy, and we could use right here the y-intercept. This y-intercept right here is 0, 4. 
and the zero is my x, and the four is my y, so we're going to plug those in for x and y. So instead of writing y equals, I'm going to write four equals a. Instead of writing x minus one, I'm going to write zero minus one, and then I'm going to have zero minus four. So four equals, this piece right here is going to be a negative one, and this piece right here is going to be a negative four. So when I multiply a negative one times a negative four, I'm going to get a times 4, and then when you divide the 4 over, your a value equals 1. So his equation was definitely y equals x minus 1 and x minus 4. And if you want, because we found that a is 1, you can put that 1 right there out front. Number 11 gives you the um, graph on the screen. It says label the following x-intercept, y-intercept, vertex, and if it's a max or a min. So... This right here and this right here are my x-intercepts. And this right here is my vertex. And this vertex is the highest point. So since the highest point, we're going to say that it's a max. I should have put this over here. The vertex is a max. This little dot right here, which is what this line was for, but this little dot right here is my y-intercept. So based on the color coding on my screen, you can see that green was my y-intercept, this red was my vertex, which was the max, and these two things are my x-intercepts. And then it says at the end, include the word and the ordered pair. So let's go back and write in all the ordered pairs. So this x-intercept right here is 1, 2, 3 over. So this x-intercept is 3, 0. It says this one right here is over 1 in the negative direction, so negative 1, 0. And then my vertex is over 1, up 1, 2, 3, 4. So over 1, up 4. And finally, my y-intercept right here is up 3, so my y-intercept is 0, Three. Remember that at an x-intercept, y is always 0, and at a y-intercept, x is always 0. So the next six problems all to go together, uh, 12 through 17 on your review, and they all talk about how they want you to tell you what, tell, what transformations happen. So we're going to compare to the parent function, which is f of x equals x squared. And so we're going to go through 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and talk about what happened in each situation. So let's start with number 12. So number 12, your equation is f of x equals negative x squared. So the first thing to do is, what is different in comparison to the two equations? Well, the negative is different, and then you have to figure out what did the negative do. The negative flips the parabola, or reflects the parabola, over the x-axis so that it opens down. So this was a vertical... reflection, or a reflection across the x-axis. So we're going to keep doing the same thing. So now if you look at number 13, you have g of x equals negative 2x squared minus 3. So again, we're going to play the game. Uh, what happened here? Well, I have a negative out front. I have a 2, and I have a minus 3. So this is all different from the parent function. So again, this is going to be the vertical reflection This 2, if you were to graph it and compare, this 2, because it's bigger than 1, actually makes the parabola grow faster. So it's a vertical stretch. And this minus 3 physically moves the parabola down 3. So it's a translation And then you could write down that it went down three units. Number 14, the equation is h of x this time. And we have one half x squared. 
So I hope that you're telling yourself that the one half is what's different. The one half out front is a vertical something, and because this one half is actually less than one, it's a vertical compression, like I'm pushing it down. Just want to draw a quick graph. So, quick graph, don't judge my drawing abilities. If this is my regular parabola, when this one half thing happens, it actually pushes the parabola down, and so the parabola appears to become wider. On number 13, when that 2 was out front, it would have pulled the parabola up like this faster. Okay, so number 15, hopefully you can do this one. I think you should pause the video at this point and try by yourself, and then unpause the video and come back and listen. So for number 15, you are given j of x equals 2x squared. Well, the only thing here that is different is the 2, and we just talked about in the last problem, this number out front. Since this number out front is bigger than 1, it's going to be a vertical stretch. Number 16 says that you have f of x equals 5x squared minus 2. So I have a 5 and I have a minus 2. You should get this down by now that the 5 is a vertical. It's going to be a stretch. And then you have this minus 2 thing, which is going to be a vertical translation, and this one's going to cause it to go down 2. And then finally we have number 17, and number 17 says that we have f of x again, only this time f of x equation is negative 1 half, or sorry, 1 fifth x squared. So those things that are different are the negative and the 1 fifth. The negative reflects it over the x-axis, or it's a vertical reflection. So reflect across the x-axis or a vertical reflection. And the one-fifth again is a vertical, but it's a compression because it's less than one. Okay, number 18 says that we are going, that Chris solved the equation x squared minus 6x minus 2 equals 6 by completing the square. What steps did Chris take to complete the square? What is the solution? So let's actually do the problem. We'll talk about our steps along the way. So for 18, I have x squared minus 6x minus 2 equals 6. So step one is you need to move the c value to the other side. So you're going to add it on both sides. So that's your first step. Move the c value over. So now you have x squared minus 6x equals 6 plus 2 is 8. The next step is not really a mathematical step, but it's something that I do. I'm going to say that I have x squared minus 6x plus my blank equals 8 plus my blank. Because you have to, if you add it on one side, it's an equation, so you have to add it on the other. Now to find this blank, you're going to do b over 2, and you're going to square it. b over 2, and you're going to square it. So my b value is negative 6 divided by 2 squared. So negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. So I'm going to add a 9 to both sides. And all I'm doing is adding, a, I'm going to add a new page because I'm going to run out of room. So now what I have is x squared minus my 6x plus that 9 that I had equals, you had an 8 plus a 9, so 8 plus 9 is 17. We're now going to factor. This 9 is the perfect square so that when you factor this, and if you need to use the box you can, but you factor this and you're going to get x minus 3 times x minus 3, which is the same thing as x minus minus 3 squared equals 
17. And now to finish solving, you're going to take the square root of both sides. Just remember that when you take the square root, you need to put a plus or minus out front because the square root of 4 is plus and minus 2. So you have x minus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 17. Then you have to move the 3 over by adding it. So what you're going to have is x equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 17. And that's your solution in all the steps that you took. So the next problem says that Jill is designing her name using a geometric using geometric shapes. She is using a rectangle for the letter I, as shown below. And the area of the rectangle is 60 square centimeters. What is the width? So you have a picture on your paper that says that this is x, and this is x plus 7. And so area is equal to length times width. So 60 is going to equal my length, which is x, times x plus 7. And we're going to multiply or distribute this x in. So 60 equals x squared plus 7x. We need this to equal 0 so that we can factor. So we're going to subtract the 60 from both sides. So you now have 0 equals x squared plus 7x minus 60. And then you're going to make your box so you can factor. In the top box goes your x squared. and your bottom box goes negative 60. And then you need some factors of 60 that make 7. So 1 and 60, 2 and 30, 3 and 20, 4 and 15. I'm going to keep going. Let's see, 5. Five and twelve, and there's your magical pair. Five and twelve, and then, and then, since this one's a negative, they're gonna have opposite signs. Since this is a positive, the bigger number has to have a plus sign. So this one's a plus, that one's a minus. So now we have minus five x and positive twelve x, and then you factor. The negative 5 and negative 60 have a negative 5 in common. x squared and 12x have an x in common. x squared and negative 5x have an x in common. 12 and negative 60 have a 12 in common. So this thing factors into x minus 5 and x plus 12. And again, this still equals 0, so you're going to set each piece equal to 0. So x can equal 5 or x can equal negative 12. And I got that because if you do x, plus, x minus 5 equals 0 and you add the 5 over, x would equal 5. Same thing for the 12. If you're doing the 12, x plus 12 equals 0. If you minus the 12 over, you're going to get that x equals the negative 12. Okay, but if you look at these, this... These x's that we're talking about meet a side length. So it doesn't make any sense to use this one, because if I use negative 12 right here, I'm going to have a negative length, and we can't have a negative length. So this is the only one that makes sense. But please be very careful, because this 5 is what the length is over here in my picture. The question asked me for my width. So to find my width, I have to do 5 plus 7, so my width is 12. Please make sure you answer the question that is asked of you. Okay, 20, 21, 22, and 23 are all asking you to find C to, so that you complete the square. And so if we do number 20, number 20 says that it's going to be x squared minus 18x plus C. To find this magical C thing, you're going to do B over 2 and you're going to square it. 
So in this problem, my B value is negative 18. So if I were to do number 20, negative 18 divided by 2 and then square it. So negative 18 divided by 2 is negative 9. Negative 9 squared is 81, which means the C value in number 20 is 81. So before you watch the rest of this video for 21, 22, and 23, pause the video at this point in time and try them by yourself. So for 21, the equation is x squared plus 22x plus c. Again, to find my c value, you're going to do b over 2 squared. My b value right here is 22, so I'm going to have 22 over 2 squared. You can type it in your calculator, do it in your head, but I prefer that you do it in your calculator so you don't get it wrong. 22 divided by 2 is 11. 11 squared is 121, so my c value is 121. 22, you have x squared plus 9x plus c. You're going to do b over 2, and you're going to square it. Again, I highly recommend that you use calculator, because especially on this one, you're going to get a decimal or a fraction, depending on which way your calculator spits it out at you, and that's okay. So we're going to do 9 over 2 squared. 9 divided by 2 is 4.5, and when you square it, you get 20.25. So C in this case is 20.25. And number 23, you have x squared minus 7x plus C. Again, you're probably going to get a decimal on this one. So B over 2 squared, negative 7 divided by 2 squared. So you're going to type it in your calculator. Negative 7 divided by 2 is negative 3.5. And then when you square it, you should get that C is equal to 12.25. So number 7 says a quadratic function is graphed and said to have no real solution. So that's super important. So we have no real solutions. How many x-intercepts does it have? Well, you need to know that solutions are synonyms or synonymous with x-intercepts and roots and zeros. They all are closely related and almost sometimes the same thing. So solutions tell me how many times I cross the x-axis, which thus tells me how many x-intercepts I have. So if I have no solutions, that means I'm going to have no x-intercepts. So if I were to draw a graph, you just need to draw something like this, or maybe like this, that never ever touches the x-axis. So you're going to have zero x-intercepts. Number eight says when a quadratic function is graphed and said to have one real solution, how many intercepts does it have? Again, you have one intercept, which means you're going to have one zero or one x-intercept or one solution. So if we graph something that would have one solution, it's only going to touch the x-axis once. So I could touch right here and do this. Or I could touch here, maybe, and I'll go down. But both times here, I only touch once. So for number eight, you're going to have one x-intercept because you have one solution. And then finally, on number 9, it says that you have two real solutions. So if you were to draw something with two real solutions, I hope you have guessed by now that you're going to touch the x-axis twice. So this could be an example or that. But I've gone through the x-intercept one, two times, and then one, two times. So you're going to have two x-intercepts because you had two real solutions.